And I ask for applause for our speakers, Bruins, FX, and Greg, who are gonna, well, we might see Google and Apple go down today. Thank you. Um, so, sorry for the delay. Um, I'm, I'm not used to have co-speakers, so we had synchronization problems. If you ever did parallel programming, then you know what I'm talking about. Um, so, uh, what's the motivation here? Um, it, if you look at, at the modern client platforms that many of you carry around, and I'm not talking about your mobile phones, but the bigger ones, um, then you see fundamentally different, like they're not the, the general computing device anymore that uh, you used to have. Like a PC could be used for anything. But um, now we see things that have different general ideas, different architectures, um, different software sources and clouds and rain and everything. Um, so we will talk about two different devices. Uh, one of them is like, if you ever get spam, um, Look at, look at the ones that come from Apple, because like, the iPad is the actual only penis enlargement device you can buy on the internet that actually works, uh, <laughs> which you can, you know, you can enlarge it. <laughs> so alternatively, um, if, you're, if you're more old style and you actually want a keyboard, do you want to open this? Um, you, you can buy something like this. This is a Chromebook uh, from Samsung, and it allows you to actually type. So, um, what do we not cover in this presentation? Um, we're not covering iPhones, iPad 2, anything jailbreaking or SIM and locking, and uh, I promise that was the only penis you saw in the entire presentation. <laughs> Let's get a bit serious. Um, we had the question before about the fanboys. I had this idea of having the Apple fanboys with turtlenecks on one side and then the Google fanboys with bright colors on the other. Um, anytime you, you buy a device or you decide to use a certain device, um, keep in mind that they're not doing this for fun or um, because they want to be nice to you or anything. Um, there is very solid reasons behind it. Um, in this case, it's 29 billion US dollars reasons, uh, which essentially comes from 32 million devices sold only in last year. Um, and that makes um, 20 billion US dollars just income. Um, on top of that, 30% of every sale in App Store uh, goes to Apple. That's another 6 billion. And then 30% of the revenue that your mobile carrier does um, with your iPad actually goes to Apple, which ends up being 2.8 billion dollars, um, which goes to 28,000 shareholders. And that's the entire reason they make the iPad. So um, accordingly, the design goals of a device like an iPad are centered around this idea of revenue. So um, what Apple wants is a consistent, fluent user interface that you all jerk off to. Um, they want integrity protection of the operating system and upgrades um, simply because they want to um, keep control over them and they want to restrict everything third party. Uh, where you get the software, what the software can do, what the content is, what content you can see, um, and what payment models there are. Protecting your data is actually not part of the business model. So. Um, you get your software from the App Store, which essentially is your only source for software. If it's not any App Store, it doesn't exist. Like, if Google doesn't find it, it doesn't exist, right? Um, you have an Apple ID. You have a very restrictive and fairly intransparent um, sign-up process for development. Um, we went through that um, ourselves and got rejected several times for don't know. Um, you're supposed to pay like 100 or 99 dollars a year. Um, if, if you're a lawyer or aspiring lawyer, I highly recommend reading the Apple contracts that come with the App Store. Uh, they're extremely entertaining. So essentially, uh, pretty much every right that you would like to have goes to Apple. Uh, but the entire damage is limited to 50 dollars. So um, whatever they fuck up, um, the maximum damage they have is $50, which is half of the damage that a credit card um, puts on you. 
So um, um, the same actually holds true for the, um, for the review process for apps, uh, when you submit apps for the App Store. Um, essentially, nobody knows what happens. So they, they call to have a bunch of monkeys sitting there and like clicking on iPhones. Nobody fucking knows. Um, it actually takes a while, and here's the first security issue with that. Um, it actually also takes a while for updates. So um, if you are a developer and you fucked up your app and you want to ship a security update, it will actually possibly take about like two weeks um, or be rejected uh, for inappropriate content. Um, so if you ever um, considered why there is no security software for the iPhone, for example, um, that is exactly the reason um, Apple doesn't want you to have the feeling that security software is necessary. Um, so, on the other hand, why does Google actually uh, make the Chromebook? So, um, you have to understand that Google actually makes 96% um, of their revenue, um, which ends up being $28 billion a year, from advertisement. So, um, that leaves them with about $8 billion profit. Um, they're not really paying that much taxes, actually, um, which is to 67% uh, voting power or 91% of the financial power goes to the two founders and um, the now former CEO. So for that to happen, for the user to actually supply all the data that they can burn into profiles and then sell for this large amount of money, the user actually has to trust Google that Google will do the right thing. Um, and if, if you ever wondered why Google comes out with like free operating systems for mobile phones, um, this is what Warren Buffett calls a um, economic mode. So um, you have a CASA, which is Google's money-making machine for ads, and you don't want other companies to get close to the CASA. So you're providing free products in spaces where other companies actually need to pay and, and actually um, need to make revenue off the product. And so you prevent other people from getting into your market. Um, and from this, the design goals for the Chromebook um, actually are derived and are a lot more, um, a lot different. Uh, so essentially what Google wants is exclusively running the web browser. You can't actually run anything else. Uh, it really, really doesn't want to have third-party software on the Chromebook um, for actual security reasons, because here the protection of the user data is a design goal uh, because they want the user data to be safe so the user is happy to use the Chromebook and sends the data over to Google. Um, also, they want multiple users to be able to share the same device so universities can buy like, you know, 500 Chromebooks and then um, everyone uses them and they're all, um, they're all safe. And also, um, Google understood very, very early that um, winning the hearts of the nerds is most important. So um, if Google sets up a DNS, um, none of the nerds will say, well, they're collecting all this data because all of the nerds go like, look at this IP address, 8.8.8.8, .8 this is so cool. Um, <laughs> and well, for, forgotten are all the privacy concerns. Um, and they understood that. So um, Google also has a, App Store, or in this case, a web store, and it follows the same principles. Um, they want it to be open. Um, you only pay like $5 um, for publishing. You can only uh, publish Chrome extensions. Everything is HTML, JavaScript. Um, Chrome extensions for the Chromebook cannot have um, NP API, which is the old Netscape plugin API um, binaries, because they don't want binaries on a Chromebook. And the contractual relationship is actually fairly light compared to Apple's, but then compared to Apple's, everything is light. So um, let's go into details. Um, Greg here will walk you through the iPad. All right. Good evening, everyone. Um, so for the iPad details, uh, first of all, we are going to have a quick look uh, over how Apple actually implemented the iPad to achieve the design goals that FX already provided details on. So um, the operating system on the iPad is basically the standard XNU system that you might already know from desktop OS X, or you might not, um, which is uh, microkernel plus a FreeBSD or BSD uh, subsystem based on that microkernel. Um, 
it's like the usual Unix system, like having a kernel and user processes and uh, one non-root user named mobile, which is actually the user that runs all the apps on your iDevice. Mm. There is a little bit of extra security on the system. For instance, a kernel module called uh, Seatbelt, and it's um, used to assign profiles to applications. For instance, uh, this application is not allowed to use internet or it's not allowed to, I don't know, make use of uh, location services and whatnot. Um, there is a signature scheme for binary files that is implemented um, right from the bootloader on up to the kernel, um, and this is uh, what we're going to detail on the next slides. Um, also, there is a uh, system-wide secure storage for credentials, like for your uh, mail passwords, wireless LAN passwords, but this is not like a disk encryption system itself. So all the data you put on the device is like, actually not encrypted. So like all the dirty images that might be on your iDevice, <coughs> um, all this is not encrypted. Um, and there is actually, at least to our knowledge, no app that performs like full disk encryption for the device. Um, also, there is like uh, in any decent operating system you'd expect, there is uh, ASLR and DEP, at least in uh, most recent iOS versions. And that's basically it. So um, the integrity protection scheme that is implemented on the iPad which does all the signature verification stuff, um, is based right from the bootloader on. So um, the bootloader resides in ROM, which is like real ROM, it's not writable. You can only read it. And within this ROM, there is the like, first level bootloader. Mm. Also, there is a Apple public key in that ROM, and the bootloader uses this public key to subsequently verify all the bootloader stages that are loaded afterwards. So the ROM bootloader loads the LLB from Flash and verifies its signature using the Apple public key stored in the ROM. Right, so the LLB will then load the next bootloader stage from Flash again, verifies the signature, and the next bootloader stage can then load the kernel, also verify the kernel signature, and then the kernel starts and all the fancy user processes can, can be kickstarted and all that. Um, <clears throat> and that's, that's basically it. The kernel then makes use of, the, of a special uh, binary signature scheme to verify the applications on the actual device. All right, um, that's at least the fancy theory behind it. Um, when they implemented it, they uh, might have realized, um, you know, Bootloader stages in Flash can be corrupted, so it wouldn't be very nice if the device was bricked just because the bootloader stages in Flash get corrupted. All right, no problem. Um, so they added support to the bootloader to, to support USB, like USB-based file upload. Um, so the bootloader says, yeah, you know, there is this special recovery mode, which is called DFU mode. Mm, you can enter it by pressing a button combination during boot process, and once you enter DFU mode, the bootloader will actually allow subsequent bootloader stages to be uploaded using USB. Still, signature verification will be done. So this is not like, not like a very obvious backdoor that you could use. Still, signature verification is done, but <laughs> of course, um, uh, the bootloader, um, say, implements an additional feature so basically there's a buffer overflow in the USB handling code, and when you upload a bootloader image or a, yeah, a subsequent bootloader image, then um, <clears throat> you can overwrite memory, exploit it to execute arbitrary code from the bootloader on. And that you can use to break the whole chain of trust. And this is interesting because um, Apple cannot fix it, because the bug actually resides in the ROM, looter, ROM bootloader code, and this cannot be replaced without removing the chip. Um, so this is the first fail here. Uh, there is some way to overcome the code signature scheme right from the bootloader on, and it's not even patchable. So that's, that's for the first fail. Um, right. But this bug is already known, and um, so we were interested um, in how Apple actually implements all the rest of it. 
So to do the code verification, Apple uses X509. X509 is like a standard, and so Apple probably thought it's good to stick with it. Um, so they use certificate chains to actually provide signatures for their code. And a typical chain would be like there is an root CA, some intermediate CAs, and finally an end entity CA uh, or end entity certificate, which is used to sign the code. Uh, when we disassembled the bootloader code, we found that for some reason it would not verify the X509 basic constraints. So for those of you who don't know what basic constraints is, um, <clears throat> X509 is usually, usually used to build chains of trust. That is, one certificate follows another, and the first one signs the second one, and so on, and so on, and so on, until you reach the end entity certificate. And the end entity certificate is then not allowed to sign any more certificates, right? Because otherwise, the end entity could just extend the trust of the root CA to some arbitrary other guys, which is not intended to do. Um, <clears throat> so the fact if a certificate is actually a CA certificate and may sign further certificates is encoded in the basic constraints field. And this is what Apple does not track in the bootloader. So that basically means um, when we have a valid end entity certificate and the private keys that, that belong to it, then we can sign further certificates. More and more certificates are like with arbitrary content, saying arbitrary things, saying, you know, this kernel is valid, please load it. Mm. <clears throat> And actually, iOS, iOS supplies us, or Apple supplies us, with a valid signed certificate, including public keys, which they use for authenticating against the push notification server. And this certificate resides on your very iDevice, along with the private keys. So what you do is you just take off the certificate, take off the private keys, use it to sign another certificate, and then you have your arbitrary certificate that you can sign. Um, Right, it all sounds too good to be true, um, and, it, and it somehow is because um, the bootloader restricts the length of the certificate chain so that um, we cannot actually use this hack to make the bootloader run arbitrary kernels because the chain is just too long. The chain, including the push notification certificate, is just not short enough for the bootloader. So um, if you guys want, you're encouraged to find uh, maybe more or shorter certificate path that could be used to trick the bootloader into loading arbitrary code. Uh, we haven't found one. But still, um, <clears throat> such kind of bug is um, such kind of bug is already interesting enough, and so we decided to have a look at the userland, at the userland X509 implementation, right? So that is actually the X509 implementation that your browser relies on. <laughs> and interestingly, we found that also the userland X509 implementation would also not verify the X509 basic constraints. And this will then allow you to impersonate like any website, create certificates for, yeah, basically everything on the internet that uses X509 certificates, which particularly includes HTTPS, like all the TLS connections you make to your bank or to the Apple App Store. Uh, I think we're going to get more details on that later on. Um, but also the, all, the, all the encrypted mail communication that you use, like the IMAPS and POP3S, um, that's, that's, that you can all man in the middle. Uh, we have set up a test website for it, so uh, if you're in the luck, uh, <clears throat> unlucky position to have a still vulnerable device, you can just navigate to this URL, and if it says, yeah, it's all right, you see the little lock icon, then you're in trouble. Um, we, yeah, uh, we're going to see a screenshot later on. Um, we would have loved to save this bug and to like keep it OD till now, but it was a bit too severe to uh, just let it, uh, rot on our computers, and so uh, we already reported it to Apple and it's already fixed, at least for those persons who don't own too old hardware, like on the iPhone 3G, I think it's just not fixed because it just doesn't support any recent iOS operating systems, uh, and so much for uh, like Apple cares about your security, right? Um, yeah, so that's, that's the screenshot. You see the fancy lock icon here, it says, yeah, it's all right, but it actually isn't because I've uh, never in my whole life purchased a real certificate. Okay, um, the next thing we're going to see is the signature scheme they use in the, in the binary files. Um, and this is also full of fail. Um, because 
actually that that looks like a very, very intelligent idea to make use of binary signatures so that the kernel can verify the applications and all that. But um, for some reason, the signatures that are embedded in the binary files do not contain uh, signature information about the whole binary file, but just about some selected pages, with, which includes executable program pages and some other stuff but quite a bunch of meta information in the binary is not signed. So this signature scheme has actually a long tradition of being broken in jailbreaks. This is what the jailbreaking guys do exploit also. Um, and I, I don't know, for at least three iOS versions uh, I know of exploits for, for this uh, signature scheme. So this also can be considered fail. Um, the general the general approach to break it is to make use of the unsigned parts of the binary to redirect the control flow of the program, which probably you'd expect. So um, up to iOS 4.0.1, uh, you can use the library interposition feature, which is uh, kind of like debugging functionality to make you or to enable you to redirect uh, library calls to your own code so that you can intercept it and debug it. Um, as you cannot directly supply your own code because you would have to sign that, uh, you just redirect the control flow into some already signed binary and just do return-oriented programming. So that's a pretty straightforward way to get code execution there. Um, on iOS 4.1, they fixed the bug above, um, but still um, there is, of course, still other unsigned meta information, um, which is called the initializer section that's similar to the constructor section in an ELF binary, uh, which allows you to specify an address of a function that has to be called when the binary is loaded. And uh, that's pretty straightforward to redirect the control flow to any part of the program that is already signed. So again, you do return oriented programming and that's it. And um, basically in, in more recent iOS versions like uh, 4.2.1, you basically do the same, but you have to pay some attention to overcome ASLR and do some fancy tricks to overcome some range checks. But basically the, the, the bug is the same that you exploit. You, you still exploit the fact that not the whole binary is signed. So also the signature scheme uh, is considered big fail, uh, at least from our point of view. Um, so just a short word about uh, the update process. Um, on iOS, the update process is actually pretty straightforward. Um, operating system updates uh, are covered by the integrity protection of the operating system. So if you update the operating system, then you basically reinstall it using iTunes, at least for iOS, uh, for older iOS versions. The, um, iOS 5 supports uh, over-the-air updates, which we haven't analyzed yet, so I can't make any claims here. But for older iOS versions, that's exactly the situation that the integrity protection scheme already covers it. Um, application updates, like all the stuff that you receive from the App Store, are also covered by the App Store. And this is what Bruins is going to detail on, um, so I won't, won't uh, get too much into detail here. Um, there is one thing, if you have a radio chip, a GSM radio chip in your iDevice, then the carrier can actually push, um, say, profiles to your device. And those profiles include APN settings for the, for the PPP connection, all that stuff. Um, also include proxy settings. But we haven't had a deep look into it. So again, you're encouraged uh, to look into those profiles and see if uh, there is anything useful or interesting we can make of it. <laughs> All right, I think that's it. Um, so I'm going to hand over to Bruns. Hi. So um, I'm going to talk a bit about the App Store architecture. The App Store is mostly like a standard online store. So you have content in HTML and JavaScript, which is rendered by a browser and is transported via HTTP. And um, for things like uh, login and authentication and checkout, you switch to HTTP HTTPS. Um, so the client is mostly a web kit, which only talks to um, whitelisted hosts and which has some special API which is implemented in native code. Um, so there are several problems with this. Um, if you want to profit from uh, browser security features, then you need a browser's user interface. Because, um, well, without an address bar, HTTPS does not make so much sense. 
And if you do not indicate the source of pop-ups, then the user does not know whether a pop-up asking you for your password is actually supplied by a secure page or by an insecure page. Furthermore, the um, JavaScript library kind of circumvents the same origin policy. So, well, standard web security does not cut the cake for Apple. And this is why men the middle attacks are really, really bad. Um, you can inject JavaScript into some harmless page and redress the entire user interface and fish for passwords. Or you can install and make the victim even pay for your historian by just calling this API, API function iTunes.byAction. And things like CSRF tokens do not really apply because the native code will happily inject all the correct tokens for you. This is really hard to fix for Apple um, because the only thing they could do is switch the entire store over to HTTPS only. Um, so here we have a screenshot of how the login screen looks like. Um, you see no indication of the source of it. It's designed to look like a native app and not like a web page, the entire app store. And here's the code how to render a fake login screen. So, however, not even vanilla web security was done correct in the App Store. Um, there were many things like insecure cookies allowing to take over accounts, missing or, well, really missing CSRF tokens. And, well, if you had an XSS bug anywhere, then you would get really, really trouble because you would get drive-by downloads. Um, and we had, a, we had an XSS in the search field, actually. So you would exploit, uh, exploit such a thing by redirecting from the Safari to um, an URL with the, this special URL scheme, which, uh, yeah, which then uh, starts up the App Store client, which visits the vulnerable page. So in the search field, yeah. Um, it was, this bug was a little bit hard to exploit because the WebKit XSS auditor prevents um, the direct execution of scripts which are already present in the URL. But you can inject an iframe with a data source. In, in decent browsers, this is completely harmless because JavaScript, which executes in the data um, origin, in the context of the data origin, can't do really anything. However, it can use the API. So this got us a drive-by purchase download install attack. And here's the POC. Um, it's fixed by now, but maybe you can use it and find a different XSS bug, like anywhere in the whitelisted domains. So have fun with that. So um, essentially, bottom line for, um, for, for the Apple story is, um, they won't essentially control your content, which, you know, bottom line means they control your reality. And, um, of course, Apple could send you uh, via arbitrary means to the App Store and push you an arbitrary app. Uh, but now, luckily, we can do that too. Um, if someone has physical access, um, they can simply jailbreak your device and install additional stuff. Um, and remotely, the App Store vulnerabilities, and that doesn't only hold true for Apple, but for everyone um, with the App Store concept, um, will, be, will be there, and um, there will be high-value bugs that people use to you know, extend the functionality of your fancy um, penis enlargement devices. So, um, is that me? Yeah. Uh, so, now let's look at a device that was built in order to be uh, secure in order so you use it, so you put all your data into the Google Cloud. Um, the Chrome OS is um, a Linux-based device. It has the regular Linux security features, um, kernel user land process, you have one UID running the user land processes, you have ASLR and DEP, however, like, uh, whatever they're good for in Linux. Um, you have a pretty strong prevention of native code execution. 
Um, so one of the evil things that they did, which makes exploitation a bitch, is um, there is no file system that is writable and executable at the same time. You can think of it as a file system um, DEP. You have a personal firewall. Um, after we mentioned it, they added IPv6 support. Um, and you actually have, like with the Chrome browser, you have automatic forced updates. So it will actually update no matter whether you want it or not. Um, the only thing that you can actually run on the device is the Chrome browser. There's a few other things, but essentially it comes down to a very fancy piece of hardware that runs the Chrome browser, um, which by itself has a pretty solid security story. Um, it has a SUID sandbox, so every process runs on a different user ID, and um, you're not executing um, binary plugins. Um, it actually hides the file system from you, so when you're trying to save a file, uh, it will only show you the locations that you are supposed to see. Um, funnily enough, of course, the Flash plugin coming from Adobe just you know, completely ignores this idea and shows you the entire file system. Uh, <laughs> But <clears throat> this is not a security boundary. This is just you know, to not confuse the user. What we found really funny is, remember um, like 2008 when Alex Sotorov and, and the people um, had this MD5 collision certificate for SSL? So um, Firefox uh, went that way that they added the certificate in order to set the block bit. Well, Chrome did that too, but they left out to setting the block bit. <laughs> so um, it is in your certificate store explicitly installed, but it's not set invalid. Um, doesn't get you anywhere because the uh, certificate is, you know, uh, back to 2004 or something. Um, however, that was kind of funny. You have a um, developer mode on the Chromebook, so um, you don't have to jailbreak it. You have a little switch that you can turn on, then you get a big scary screen that says, well, now you're violating your warranty or whatnot. Um, and then you actually get um, root access. Um, so how does the protection work on the Chromebook? Um, so they, they actually had some really good ideas. Uh, the firmware and um, the, the kernel and the root file system, they're there twice. Like there's two copies of each. Um, and every copy is like one chain. So uh, you have the read-only memory on Flash that verifies the firmware key block, that verifies the firmware uh, preamble, and uh, you know it goes on and on. It verifies the kernel. It verifies everything. Um, the key mat material in every stage obviously sits in a stage before, um, and the, the two file systems and kernels and everything being redundant allows them to actually have pretty decent recovery stories. Um, also, the, the file system integrity protection um, is something new. It's called DM Verity, so it's a uh, DM um, module for the device manager. Um, so what they, what they do is they actually have the file system not covering the entire partition, but there is um, SHA-1 hashes of the blocks behind this, and then there is a hash over the hashes that gets passed as a kernel parameter um, into, the, you know, into the kernel when you boot the kernel. So um, that is pretty smart because you're actually checking the integrity of individual blocks below the file system once the block is accessed. And once the block is accessed and is in cache, you're not checking the uh, signature again. Um, it's, a, it's a principle that many uh, embedded systems people should actually uh, follow. So there's a few imperfections that we found. Um, well, Google guys are smart, and we're not so smart. So, uh, but there's a few things that, that you know show the partition table is actually not integrity protected. So you know if someone can write your partition table, uh, you're pretty much fucked. Um, then there's two partitions. One is called the OEM partition. One is called the EFI partition, um, and they're not integrity protected. So. If you would actually buy the story that the Chromium OS is the same as the Chrome OS, and you compile the Chromium OS, and you put it on your personal laptop thingy, uh, you're not running the Chrome EFI BIOS. So it will actually load EFI stuff from your EFI partition. And Chrome doesn't care about this scenario. Um, and they just you know, load whatever you have, and this enables you to have EFI backdoors. 
Um, also, there's a funny, uh, unfortunately not exploitable, but funny uh, breach in the integrity protection chain. Because what they do is, like I told you, that they um, the pass the share one um, of the file system when they load the kernel. However, what they sign and what they check is this, like when they, when they actually load the kernel, is this parameter line. And after the check, they're actually passing in the GUID of the partition um, that is going to contain the hashes. So this is what's signed, and this is what's actually booted. So if the firmware uh, can be made to, you know, fuck this up, then it's actually using arbitrary disk space um, to verify the SHA-1 hashes. Also, um, I mentioned in the, in the intro that the Chromebook is um, meant to be used by many people. So, um, what uh, Jörn, um, who's unfortunately not here because he's DJing right now at our party already, um, what, what he found out is it's really trivial to you know, solder two pins together and make the read-only flash area less read-only. So, <laughs> so uh, once you install a different initial bootstop loader, you obviously can do whatever you want. Um, so in this university scenario I mentioned before, it is two solar points uh, to own every other student in your class uh, forever. Um, here's the user data encryption. Um, it's pretty decent. I'm going to skip over that because we're running out of time. What is interesting is uh, that what Google did was they, they actually connected your account password um, to the crypto scheme. So um, the part of uh, part of the key scheme actually depends on your account password, uh, which is then truncated to prevent offline brute force, um, however effective that is. So, Web Store. Yep. Yeah. So, um, the Google Web Store is used to distribute extensions for the Chrome browser, and um, so which are in most in HTML and JavaScript. Um, and these extensions get access to an additional API, um, depending on permissions granted to them by the user upon install. These extensions are partially for free, partially you have to pay for them, but you always get the source code because it's JavaScript. Um, and extensions are really, really good for e-banking Trojans and this kind of things because the API is designed to make it simple to inject into the DOM of other pages. So, I mean, it's like, like a work of a few hours to write something to attack an e-banking site in this. Um, the first thing to note is that um, you do not have to actually pay for paid extensions. You can just um, construct an URL which allows you to download them. This also applies to um, beta test, to extensions in beta testing, and um, Google won't fix it. They will update the documentation. That's their fix. Um, so, how to install malicious extensions onto a victim's browser? Um, so, the first thing is, of course, social engineering. Um, but otherwise, what's interesting is Google Sync. So, you can synchronize a list of installed extensions to your Google account. And if you enable this, then a pwned Google account means a pwned browser. Um, furthermore, there was one really nice bug. Um, so, Chrome exposes a special API to the web store domain, and this one is used to install extensions. And they kind of fucked up the whitelist, so there were HTTP domains inside, so you, so you could um, install extensions from a man-in-the-middle attacker. And um, the confirmation dialog where the user grants the permission also used to be rendered from JavaScript, which could be uh, forgotten by the attacker. <laughs> um, so, another thing is, there are really more things you could do with malicious extensions. Um, for example, you could run clickjacking attacks against internal browser pages in order to do things like insert new SSL certificates, or you could rewrite download links so that they point to malicious files afterwards in order to get full system compromise. Okay, so much for the Google Web Store. Another thing we looked at are Google Apps. Google Apps are very different. These are just plain web apps like Google Docs. 
um, or Gmail. And Unity C, um, if you use this, then uh, you completely trust into one session cookie or into a lot of session cookies. If you lose one of them, all your data is lost or if um, Google stops behaving fair to you. And um, there are many, many Google apps um, by different authors. Also many of the apps which are by now provided by Google were actually produced by companies which Google bought. And um, this is very inconsistent and basically an authentication nightmare. So some of the inconsistencies. Um, one thing was macros in Google Docs. So you, um, in Google Docs, you can upload macros in some JavaScript dialect, and these are executed server-side. Also, you're supposed to, um, there's some kind of marketplace for macros where you can execute or import macros written by other people. For example, one of the most um, popular macros was a credit card number validity checker by some Russian authors. <laughs> Yeah, so um, luckily you can inspect the source code. This one was actually benign. But um, if I used it in my, um, well, spreadsheet, then later on the author could update his script and um, it would update in my spreadsheet as well and be less benign. Furthermore, um, uploaded macros are executed server side and they can issue web requests. And these come from Google servers. So that's fun for IP address, filter address filtering, and it's really fun for denial of service because these Google servers have a big, big pipe. <laughs> Only Google can DOS Google. <laughs> so some more inconsistencies. Um, there, when you, surf long and look at the various different things that can happen between the Google pages. We had one bug where, um, where uh, when, you, when you switched accounts, there was a token which was transferred in the clear. So um, I think the details are not that interesting any longer. It's fixed and um, you could exploit it by um, logging a user in from a man in the middle attacker. So um, there were also some cross-site scripting issues. I don't think I'll go into the details, but what's interesting is the quality of the code is really, really inconsistent. I mean, there are services like Postini by Google, which have an abysmal source, quali source code quality, like multiple cross-site scriptings in, search panel, in the search fields of an admin panel. I mean, it's really different, uh, the quality of the different Google apps. Another important point, if you want to entrust your data to the cloud, is um, how do these different, um, well, Google app, how do these different web apps um, exchange your data? So it's supposed to work via protocols like OAuth or OAuth2 or OutSub, and the idea is, um, a page like eve.com requests access to my, my data on Google and redirects my browser to the Google page, puts its, its um, access request into a get parameter, and then Google asks me whether, it, whether I should allow the access, and um, then a token is generated and passed back. This is bad in view of URL redirectors like this. Google wants to access my data on Google. Well, better allow. However, the data is sent in the end uh, to us. Um, because it's leaked in the referrer. Because uh, this huge URL there redirected to our homepage. So um, that's it for me. Thank you. Um, so essentially, uh, if, if you're a fanboy and you don't want to hear this, um, essentially Google can do whatever they want to your data. Uh, that's the whole point. Um, if you know you follow the drama with G Plus accounts, um, people putting all their data in there, and then you know having the account canceled because their name doesn't sound like a real name. Um, 
we actually do think that there will, in the future, uh, be more and more ways that people can get your Google account or session. Um, the thing with, with the whole cloud concept is the moment someone gets your session, uh, you're fucked. I mean, literally uh, cluster fucked in, both, in like all holes. So um, if you like to go to you know, um, cafes with Waveline and hang around in the St. Oberkloppi uh, in, in Berlin or somewhere, um, you shouldn't actually use your Google accounts. Um, and this can like, uh, this can actually affect you really hardly. Uh, I talked to one of the HP Gary guys. Uh, they were watching anonymous downloading their emails for eight hours before Google actually closed their account. Um, <laughs> that hurts. Um, back to the Chromebook. If someone has physical access to the Chromebook um, and Google doesn't promise you any security on the on a physical access scenario, they can essentially backdoor it, but forever. And that's bad because the design is um, the de device is designed to be shared. And um, well, if you install a, cr a Chrome extension or you update a Chrome extension, um, be sure that you know that your ass is owned. So, um, in general, what, what we found after we looked at all those issues is this is not the security you're looking for. Um, whatever altruistic reasons you think the company has to provide you with the cool tools and um, the cool web apps, uh, that's not the reasons they have. And if, if you rely on a cloud uh, system to have all your data in, it's, you're putting all your eggs in one basket, and it's not your basket. They don't care if they lose a single user. You will probably care if you lose all your data. Um, what is also interesting is that uh, if we look at web security, and I mean, the, the company Google is to the rim full of brilliant engineers. But even Google um, appears to think that OVASP top 10 is something that you need to achieve for compliance, which, in fact, you, know, you should actually not have. Um, and um, Greg wants to say something, I think. Um, yeah, right. Um, so the point here is um, regarding the Apple data protection. Um, if Apple actually wanted to protect your data, they would probably allow you to roll your own crypto on the devices, to exchange the root keys and all that stuff, but they don't. That's not about your data. That's about Apple's security here. That's not your security, right? Um, <clears throat> so that's, that's just regarding the features marketed as security for you, maybe security for the vendor. That's, that's the point here, I guess, yeah. And with that, um, we thank you for being here, and um, now we you know, open for questions because we actually have fucking time. Um, and then we go to a large party that we provide a bus schedule to. So if, if you actually want to hop on a bus and then go to a party, this is the night to do so. Thank you. Thanks very much to all three of you for that very thorough analysis. Uh, I'm sure there are lots of questions. And I guess the guys are happy to take them. Thanks for uh, not you asking know, questions that, makes, that brings drinking 10 minutes earlier. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, you know the, the deal. We have the mics in the aisles, so if you Line up at those mics. Okay, so thanks for your talk. It was very interesting. But um, what are we supposed to do now? I mean, iOS insecure, the Chromebook insecure. Uh, yeah. Um, I, might, I might actually sound too old school, but how about running your fucking own mail server? Uh, you mentioned that the uh, iPad comes with a uh, pre -in is chipped with a user certificate. Uh, I wonder, is this the, uh, is it really shipped with the certificate or is it the one which is downloaded during the activation of the iPad? 
uh, as far as I remember, it is not, uh, yeah, it is actually downloaded as far as I remember. So, but in that scenario, it doesn't make any difference because you get the certificate when you uh, register or activate the device. So, one question from the internet. Does the two-factor authentication protect against the Google Chromebook attacks? I think he means two-factor authentication process helps against the Google Chromebook attacks? Uh, I think meant is the Google two-factor authentication where you get an SMS message with a token for login. Um, so. Mm -hmm. Most of the attacks, like, not just the ones that we found, but the ones that we're expecting to see in the future, um, deal with, especially in the, in the Google Cloud scenario, deal with stealing the session cookie. So that's past authentication. So no matter how many factors you used for authentication, at the end of the day, um, the, the web applications need to um, keep the authentication state, and that's in a session cookie, and this is what you usually steal. That's it. Thank you very yep. much for coming and let's have a party.